Chancellor, and President Shepard, it is my honor to present to you Mr. Robert Colnerisi, an internationally recognized authority on the politics of foreign aid and African economic development. Loyola College alumnus and former Rhodes Scholar, Mr. Calderisi's career can be viewed as a series of contributions to public service and humanitarian causes. His career in foreign aid and economic development began in 1975 when he became senior planning officer for the Canadian International Development Agency. That step led him along the long and adventurous road which would see him reach several senior positions with the World Bank in Africa and elsewhere. With his advanced training in economic systems and international relations, Mr. Calderisi could well have secured posts in academia or the private sector. Instead, he chose to work in the public domain and to devote himself to the development and administration of foreign aid to some of the poorest nations on earth. This is only fitting for one who so well personifies Loyola's Jesuit commitment to public service and humanitarian concerns. Following his retirement in the year 2002, Mr. Calderisi has written three books on the problems of foreign aid and economic development in Africa. In particular, his 2006 book, The Trouble with Africa, why foreign aid isn't working, has become a central text in the international debates on the politics of foreign aid. He is frequently invited to consult with foreign governments and to address international conferences on that subject. Throughout his many years abroad, Mr. Calderisi remains a Montrealer at heart and an active alumnus and benefactor to Concordia. In 2015, Mr. Calderisi endowed the Ronald Calderisi Scholarship in Biochemistry in honor of his late brother, an award which emphasizes the training of First Nations peoples in that field. Mr. Chancellor, on behalf of Senate and the Board of Governors, it is my privilege and honor to present to you Mr. Robert Calderisi so that you may confer upon him the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa. I'd like to ask Dr. Calderisi to make his remarks to the convocation. Thank you. Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President and Vice Chancellor, honored platform guests, family and friends, and distinguished graduates, I am deeply grateful for the honor that my university is bestowing on me today. Whether or not I deserve it at now, I s intend to try to live up to the honor in the future. It's also a great honor for me to be able to talk to you on uh, this very special day in your lives. In some respects, I envy you. In other respects, I'm quite happy to be on this side of the podium. 
Uh, Winston Churchill was once asked if he would live his life all over again. And he said, no, because I'm not likely to have the same string of good luck that I had the first time around. I've um, never met Winston Churchill. I'm not that old. But I have met some very impressive people in my life. Uh, Mother Teresa, uh, the Nelson Mandela, two of the great founders of modern Africa, Julius Nyerere of Tanzania, and Félix oufouet Wenyi of uh, Côte d'Ivoire. And closer to home, I've had the privilege of meeting uh, Lester B. Pearson, who was Canada's only Nobel Peace Prize winner and Pierre Elliott Trudeau. But perhaps um, the most impressive person I've met in my life was not a politician uh, or a writer uh, or a scientist or a business person or a human rights advocate or environmentalist, but a simple nurse that I met in West Africa uh, in April of 1994. I'd been touring a large number of clinics and dispensaries that morning. I was heading up the World Bank office there, and it was a very discouraging visit. Very, none of the dispensaries I visited had the basic necessities for providing care to people coming there. They had no bandages, no medicine, not even mattresses. In one maternity clinic that morning, a woman was injured uh, in, during childbirth. And in the absence of surgical thread, the desperate midwife had to sew her up with electric wiring. I was uh, obviously, the, the staff at these clinics were listless and demoralized, as I would have been. And I felt demoralized myself because I knew how many hundreds of millions of dollars the World Bank and other aid donors were investing in that country's health system. So I was quite ready to go back to my air-conditioned office in the capital and write my report. But before we did that, we um, decided to visit one other clinic and were greeted at the door by uh, this wonderful person dressed in immaculate uniform with a radiant smile and really very happy to see us. Little wonder, she had everything she needed. Her medicine cabinets uh, were full. She, her patients were sleeping in beds rather than on the floor. She had detailed log books in which she was meticulously tracking the treatment and conditions of her patients. She didn't have any running water, but she'd convinced an Italian charity to dig a well there the following week. She was even replacing the doors and windows of the clinic, which had been eaten away by termites. What was the difference? She had decided not to wait for the state to meet its obligations, but instead had asked the mothers in the area to make a small contribution to the running uh, of the clinic. It was her inventiveness, her determination, yes, even her charm that had tipped uh, the balance. I thought that perhaps she'd been working there for six months, which explained her enthusiasm. But in fact, she'd been working continuously in that clinic for 11 years. Now, people in Western business schools now would call her a, a social entrepreneur. I thought of her then, and still do now, more simply as a saint. She was a model of service, but also a model of ambition, a quiet form of ambition. Life without ambition is like setting out on a sailboat uh, on a windless sea. But winds can grow strong and tip you over. Arnold Bennett, who is a now forgotten 
novelist uh, uh, from the UK, uh, but who was immensely popular in the first half of the early 20th century, had um, a rather uh, unpleasant image about excessive ambition. He compared it to heating a house with coal. He said 90% of the heat goes up the chimney rather than into the room. He was also rather grumpy about uh, happiness. He thought happiness was a matter of temperament, that no amount of effort or struggling in life would improve your well-being. And to quote him directly, he said, what you're living now is life itself. It is, it is much more so than what you will be living 20 years hence. Grasp that truth, dwell on it, absorb it. Let it influence your conduct to the end that neither the present nor the future be neglected. In short, settle down at once into life. So as you set sail on your careers, I wish you the serene determination of that wonderful nurse in West Africa and the contrarian wisdom of that crusty old English novelist. Congratulations and good luck to all of you. Félicitations et bonne chance à vous tous. Dr. Saldarisi, thank you for your remarks, your humility, your leadership, and the example you set for so many in this world. Thank you.